So we'll start this morning. You know, this has been a this has been a a long week. It's been a very long week for us as a church family, as individuals. As we look at our lesson this morning, I'd like for us to all look at what we're willing to do. The name of our of our lesson is willing. As we go through life, we have changes in our life. We may lose a job and have that feeling of what am I going to do to provide for my family because I'm laid off and I have no other income. Some may step up to offer help to you. I remember a time when my brother called me and said, I'm going to make your house payment while you're laid off. You know, back then my house payment wasn't but $95. Everybody looks around and says, $95, that's not nothing. Well, back in 1965, $95 was a lot of money. Because groceries, you could buy groceries for a week for about 20 or less. Isn't that right? Yeah, pretty close. And most, uh, you weren't old enough. <laughs> Don, look out, Don, look out. I also can remember times when I've, I've lost a loved one. It was very dear to me. And the struggles that I went through the uh, at the time people would tell me Ed you're uh, you're in shock and I'd look at them and say I'm and I'm not in shock I know I know what's going on I see what's going on but later on I look around and I say you was in shock you know how do we respond how do we respond when something like that happens in our lives? Whether we've lost a loved one, lost a job. Most of them are unex unexpected and uninvited. I wouldn't have invited that. You know. I can remember talking to Marlene, and as y'all know, Marlene. Lanham went to be with the Lord on on Saturday morning. And I remember talking to Marlene whenever Tom passed and even when her son Jeff passed and about the, the peace that you have. And I, and I know that a lot of people don't have that or don't feel that. But I can't explain to you the peace that I had whenever Diana passed away. I remember telling Brother Larry, I said, I I don't think I'm gonna make this. I said, this is not gonna be good. I'm not gonna make it. And his response to me was, Oh yes you will. Oh yes you will. The support of our families and, and folks, we're a family here. This is our fellowship. This is our family. We're a family. So how we support each other, how we reach out to each other, how we try to minister to each other, that is so important. I don't, I don't know of anyone that enjoys suffering. I don't, I don't care what it is. I don't like to hit my finger with a hammer, but sometimes I do. In this session, we're going to we're going to be talking and observing Jesus's love and submission to the Father's plan, and we're going to kind of marvel at His love for us. I'd like to open this session with prayer, if we can. 
Father, as we come to you this morning, we just praise you, Lord. We thank you, Father, for loving us so much. And just hallowed be your name, Father. We ask you, Father, to, to comfort the ones in our, our family, our church family, that are grieving now, Father. The ones that are still in a, a state of shock. The ones that are dealing with health issues, Father. Lord, we all depend upon you for our, our everyday life. Just ask you, Father, to, to be with us as we study this lesson. That we will be willing to trust you, Father, as you guide us. Or I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. We're studying. We're studying in Luke. Am I am I too loud over here? Or am I look? Do I need to move this thing? I'm gonna move it further down. If I move it further down, will you hurt it? Can you hear it now? Yeah, you can hear now? Yeah. Cannot hear? Now? Can you hear that? Okay. Can't hear me? Thank you for coming this morning, Gabe. We've been waiting on you. Yes. You know, you know I'm teasing you now, don't you? Okay. I just want to make sure. Some people... I tease these people sometimes, and I do tease Charlotte, and sometimes she says, doesn't know if I'm teasing her or not. So I have to say, I'm teasing you, I'm teasing you. So, isn't that right, Charlotte? Yeah, that's what I love. That's right on cue. That's what you should say. <laughs> Page 82 in our study guide. As we look at what is going to transpire, we're going to find that the Father sent an angel from heaven to strengthen Jesus. Is this the only time that an angel has ever came to Jesus and strengthened him? No, no it's not. Angels come and strengthen us and power us. We're going to find that as he, as he was praying and as he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping, he woke them up and he warned them to pray that they would not fall into temptation. How many times do we pray that we won't fall into temptation? Verse 41 says, Then he withdrew from them about a stone throws away, knelt down, and began to pray. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthened him. Being in anguish, he prayed more fervently. And his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he got up from prayer and came to the disciples, he found them sleeping, exhausted from their grief. Why are you sleeping, he asked. Get up and pray so that you won't fall into temptation. Now, a stone throws away was not very far. A stone throw away for me would be very short. 
strong throw for a young person or a young man would be a lot farther. Is that all right? Yeah. So he was a short distance away from him. He knelt down and began to pray. The typical posture for prayer among the first century Jews was standing. I know, I'm sure most of you have gone or have seen pictures of the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem when they stand and they'll rock as they pray. When we were in Jer fortunate enough to, to visit Jerusalem and we went to the to the Wailing Wall, they allowed us to go down to it. They had one stipulation is you had to wear the little cap that they would put on their head. And a lot of them were were rocking as they prayed. But in First Kings eight fifty four says when Solomon had finished all his these prayers and supplications to the Lord, he rose from before the altar of the Lord, where he had been kneeling with his hands spread out toward heaven. In Ezra, we find that he says, Then at the evening sacrifice I rose from myself abased with my tunic and cloak torn and fell on my knees with my hand spread out to the Lord my God. And there's other places in Scripture, in Daniel, and also in Acts, and in Peter. I mean, in, in Acts, when Peter rose, or when he raised Tabitha from death, So the, this was a, a, a little different than what their custom had been is for them to, to stand and pray. Notice that when Jesus faced his greatest challenge, he chose prayer as his number one priority. The number one thing that I remember doing was praying so much and praying so hard and yet still having the peace that I felt in my heart that it was that God was in control. And I think that what that's what we have to do in our life is realize that, that God is in control. Now don't don't misunderstand. You can say that to someone, but if you are not walking in that same path, you don't understand how they feel. And that's hard. In verse 42, it says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, my will, but yours be done. Jesus still had that human body. And he knew what was going to happen. He knew the punishment. He knew the sin that he was going to be dying for. In Mark's gospel, Mark adds a familiar Aromatic term Abba in Mark fourteen thirty six. He says, Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from you, yet not what I will, but what you will. That's hard for us to do. It's hard for me to do is to say, not my will, but your will. I still have that that sin that I want it to be done my way. The phrase, if you're willing, is a typical Jewish prayer expressed belief 
And the sovereign God is the one who evaluates and determines the answer to every request. We know what we desire, but our desires do not always coincide with God's purposes or timing. Our lives change. I can see and look around and see a lot of us in this room that have walked through these dark times in our lives, and yet our lives change. So we have to depend on God's will, God's path for us. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. Being in anguish, he prayed more fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. You know, I, I'm a, I guess, a hot-natured person. I always thought I was a hot-natured person until I met Jack McCartney. Jack can say good morning to you and sweat runs off of him. He, he perspires as much as anybody that I know that when we're out working together, he's as bad as I am about wiping the sweat off of ourselves. But I don't know that, I know Don touched on this last week about the, the fervent prayer that, that Jesus was praying and his sweat became like drops of blood. So I would think that would be a little thicker than the perspiration or the, the sweat that we sweat. So the anguish that he was going through. When he got up from prayer and came to the disciples, he found them sleeping, exhausted from their grief. I'm sure that the disciples were under a lot of pressure because they didn't really understand what was going on. Jesus responded to him by saying, Why are you sleeping? He asked them, Get up and pray so that you won't fall into temptation. So he's telling us here that we should be praying not to fall into temptation. The use of the term cup as he's talking about, take this cup from me, to describe an experience, either good or bad, it's biblical. In Psalms 16.5, it says, Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. In Jeremiah 49.12, it says, this is what the Lord says. If those who do not deserve to drink the cup, must drink it. Why should you go unpunished? You will not go unpunished, but must drink it. And Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours. As we move to the, to the next section, which is entitled, In Betrayal, While he was still speaking, suddenly a mob came, and one of the twelve named Judas was leading them. He came near Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When those around him saw what was going to happen, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Then one of them struck the high priest's servant and cut off his ear. It wasn't, it wasn't a long time between the time that Jesus had woke the disciples up and told them to pray until this mob came suddenly upon them. And it, it tells us that, G, that Judas was leading them.
I think I misplaced my notes pro uh, properly. Judas led them to the garden and betrayed him with a kiss. Jesus wanted to make sure that they picked out Jesus. It was dark, very dark. You couldn't probably couldn't see very much if they had any light at all. This group that came, this mob that came, was probably some of the Pharisees. It, it have, was a group of the leaders, maybe the temple police, and, and perhaps some Roman soldiers that they'd hired. But notice, it was led by Judas. He led them to Jesus. In the Near East, the uh, a kiss on the cheek signified a welcome or a friend. G uh, Judas did not consider Jesus a friend. That's kind of hard for me to understand because he had been part of that the disciples for so long and I can't quite wrap my mind around why after all he saw was happening and after all the training that was going on that he still didn't believe but I think and I think we're living in a time now where God allows people to be blind where they can't see what's happening. And I think that's happening in our country now. And so maybe this is what was happening with Judas is he was blind and could not see. The motivation of Judas to pray, of Judas to pray, to betray Jesus could have been as simple as greed or really doubts, I guess, about his Messiah, being the Messiah. Judas' example reveals the possibility of being a church member or even a recognized leader without ever having truly believed in Jesus as our Savior and Lord. Notice it says, when those around him saw what was going on, they asked, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? So they, they were ready. They were prepared, whether they had a, a large sword or whether they had a, a knife, a large knife. They were, were, were ready to defend Jesus. But also notice they didn't, they didn't hesitate. Then one of them struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. And it doesn't say he cut it. He said he cut it off. So apparently he was trying to, to kill this person. He was trying to take his life. He was probably trying to hit him in the neck or the head or something. And he hit him on the ear and he cut it. He cut off his right ear. In John chapter 18, in this uh, section here, it does not tell uh, who the disciple was that cut his ear off. But in, in John chapter 18, verse 10, it says, Then Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. And he gives the servant's name is Malachus. This really suggested that Peter was attempting to make a lethal blow or try to kill him. That's what I said earlier.
They were ready to defend themselves. Our next section is called In Action. But Jesus responded, No more of this. And touching his ear, he healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, temple police, and the elders who had come for him, Have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a criminal? Every day while I was with you in the temple, you never laid a hand on me. But this is your hour and the denomination of darkness. Jesus' response was to calm the disciples down, not or to calm Peter down, not to not to resist. Jesus then began to answer, ask the the chief priests and the temple and the elders who came for him said, "Have you come out?" with swords and clubs if I were a criminal. Every day he was teaching in the temple, but no one laid hands on him. Why do you think that... Why do you think that they didn't lay hands on him in the temple when he was teaching? And the chief priests and the... Why do you think they didn't do it? It's a possibility they didn't do it because the people that were listening to him and were believers would have revolted. They would have probably caused more trouble than what they were would would want. Jesus goes on to say, but this is your hour and the domination of darkness. So he's really telling them that this is Satan's hour and the darkness, the time of darkness that was uh, was going to come. Jesus' response is an example for us then and now. Believers do not always have to demand that their rights or retaliate when they are attacked. The fleshly temptation is to retaliate in kind with angry words or violent actions. Jesus taught his followers to love their enemies and show them a different response based on their faith in God. Our lesson asked us on page 89, it says, how does, God, how does submitting to God's will, even in the face of rejection, provide confidence and comfort? Each of us need to ask that, answer that question for ourselves. I wrote in my little book here is knowing that God has a plan for my life that I can't see. And when we're going through darkness, we can't see what God's plan is for us because we're concentrated on what we're going through. We as believers should willingly submit to God's plans. We can stand confident when following God's plan. We can submit to God's plan with, in the face of re rejection. So as believers, as we walk through these dark times in our lives, our first reaction, I think, should be prayer. I think we should be praying. And I think that we should realize that God has a plan for us. 
each of us. God has a plan for each of us today, but he also has a plan for the world and the world we live in. That's going to conclude our lesson today. If we were in a different setting, we would be asking questions, more questions, and trying to get more answers. But we don't. We're not there. Let us close in a word of prayer. Father, as we come to you, Father, we just thank you for loving us so much. Just hallowed be your name, Father. We thank you for protecting us. Father, we thank you for knowing that you have a plan for us and our lives. We ask you, Father, for comfort for the families that are dealing with uh, the stress. We ask you for, for comfort for the ones that are grieving this morning, Father. I ask you to guide us. I pray, Father, you'll be with Brother Adam as he brings his message to you this morning that we will be attentive. Just thank you for loving us again. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.